Hello, Doug. Good morning. Yeah, for you. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. I'm already it's morning. evening. <laughs> 5 p.m. my time. Yours is 8 p.m., I guess. Uh, correct. Yeah. On, on a dark, rainy day in Northern California. Northern California, okay. Yeah, here also a dark green day actually. Same. But it gets light earlier already. And we have a dog who had a cat and they wake up when it starts getting light. So by <laughs> midsummer, we're at, up at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> 4.30. Wow. Um. It's funny that we, it's only the two of us now. <laughs> yeah, where is everybody? <laughs> Are we in the right room, I wonder? But that, this is like the link that Cherry sent yesterday, so. Yeah, that's what I. Hmm. Let's wait another one minute. <laughs> Probably people are. Generally, I'm, I'm late when I'm a few minutes late. It's already full. It's already packed. So, right. So it's it's uh, doesn't look right. Um, hmm. Do you have a link for for an earlier? Nah. Just oh, I'll, here I'll comes check. somebody. Uh huh. So we. Neil, where is everybody? I think there are, yeah, could... people are really exactly hey. on time, I guess. <laughs> anyway, good talking. Yeah, same. Nice to meet you again. There are a whole bunch of people here. My goodness. Wow. <laughs> John, excellent. Glad you're here. Good to see you, Jerry. I haven't uh, met. Lovely. Oh, this is lovely. Jerry, you shaved. I did. The 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 purple thing, the purple eggplant is gone. Oh. <laughs> My wife thought I, that was very cool, by the way. Oh, thank you. I I did I did take some pictures of it, so that's good. Um, but yeah, it was it was my vow that when Trump was off stage and could no longer push the nuclear button, that it would go. <laughs> that's great. And that's so great. it's gone. Yeah. Mercifully, I think too. <laughs> well, I liked it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and you I've know, got Jerry, my. I've never seen. I've never seen bobbing for eggplant work out so well as, as it did for you. <laughs> <laughs> it did, and I've got my favorite uh, my favorite shirt on. This is uh, the undo eraser. I don't remember where I got this. I got it a really long time ago. Uh, but I think we have a lot of undo to do. Yeah. So. I, I saw this just before and <laughs> it's uncanny, but it's also uncanny when I think of you, Jerry, you could have the same kind of role. I put it in the chat. It's better to see it because I <laughs> can't explain it. If you've seen it, then it's like, wow. Eric, can you screen share it? Love that. Uh, yeah, I, I can. Just a moment. Uh, it's you should, be able to, you should be able to screen share it and play it. It's 16 seconds long. Uh, I didn't play the whole thing, but uh, it's hilarious. Just a moment. Yep. I should. Yeah, it should show it from the beginning. So. Yeah. Go. There we go. Come on. Okay. Sorry, that's weird. I'm going to let it load for a moment and put it full screen. <laughs> have you seen the mover, movie Joker, by the way? I actually have never seen it. All I've seen is ever is trailers. I'm just not interested in that franchise very much. So OK. But, so, but it is famous. And we're not hearing your audio. Ah, really? From the computer, yeah. How come? Don't know. Can I share it? 
Hmm. Should be That's weird. Yeah, I don't know how to do it then. All right. Yeah, well, usually the audio doesn't come through directly uh, from your PC. So oh, you okay. have to like put your microphone next to the speaker. Um, uh, but yeah. I think people kind of get the point. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing is that it's, it's, I, it's a, uh, when he, it's actually Trump itself and then the Joker is put on top of it. Yeah, they basically deep faked the, yeah. the, the makeup on top of his face. So that's but really it's cool. really the expression of the Joker, but it's Trump speaking. Like you can really feel this could have been the Joker speaking. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, probably in real life, he's got makeup on, on top of this, which is his natural appearance. I don't know. Exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. And, and I have my favorite OGME background going. The world is an angry place. One of my favorite OGME backgrounds, which is the, the last scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark where they're losing the Ark in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. but this is what our world of information is like these days. Mm -hmm. um, so welcome to OGM. There's a couple of people who haven't been on our, on our weekly calls yet who are on the call, which is awesome. Um, we normally just go, I go kind of up the grid and we check in. We, we talk about things that are OGME in our life. And if you haven't been here very much, that, that won't mean very much for you. So I will leave the newbies sort of toward the last of the, of the check-in and you can pass if you'd like. There's no, there's no requirement to check in, but this way we kind of turn the soil and figure out what kinds of things are happening in our lives uh, that have to do with helping humans make better sense together. And uh, I have to say that there's a whole bunch of activity kicking up around the world um, that seems to point to where we're pointing. So that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of resonance in, in different kinds of projects. Uh, Gil, I thought you had a conflict on the call. So I'm glad, glad you're here. I threw it out. You threw it out? Yeah. That is so nice. Mm. Um, awesome. So why don't we start with uh, Judy Kevin Ingrid and uh, see where everybody is. Um, I'm having a great week, uh, busy in a lot of different dimensions, but there's some building themes of coalescence in multiple organizations about seriously diving into diversity, equity, inclusion um, from an organizational level of what does it mean to our organization and as individuals, how do we participate and all of that kind of thing in a much more structured and informed and engaged way than I have seen. So that feels really positive to me. And it's kind of a chance to do my favorite thing, which is experiment in different organizations with what I have learned or observed from this group might be effective way to open dialogues to conduct constructive shared outcomes. Do the DEI conversations seem like they're breaking through to some new way of being or some new kind of interaction? Um, both, but more importantly, to actually affirming what the shared view is or the vision. What does, what does this mean if we're effective? And then what would we need to do to individually change as leaders to make those changes easier to do? And how would we help an organization engage? And, and, how would, and, and in one of them, the, one is the national science support thing that I do and each chapter is gonna approach it differently. There are 15 different chapters and they're in different places in readiness. So that's normal, but the richness of the information about the things they try and do and the success they experience and the reactions they get from their partner universities and the differences between what, you know, 50 different universities are doing, <laughs> I think will be really rich in terms of understanding what the dynamics are, how you identify where the best opportunity for progress is within a whole spectrum of potential change, um, how you measure change, how you embed change. I'm excited that many universities are starting to include in graduate education, diversity training for future faculty. Um, so the grad students are learning from a knowledge content and a practice content uh, in ways that weren't happening before. So that's probably enough, but it's, that's kind of the sense I have. And that's, that's really exciting to me. And in a, in a separate one, uh, both of these hitch into my interest in education because the science one is around science education. There's discussion of moving the scope of the national organization 
back to be more inclusive of undergraduates in addition to graduate students, which I think would be really good to do. And in the arts areas, it's around community engagement with the schools and other things. So it's sort of like there's, there's a, a rhythm to it that's both inward improving and outward reaching that is kind of exciting. Love that. Um, John, who's on the call for the first time, has an education startup that he'll talk about hopefully in a little bit when he checks in, John Cumbers. Um, and then second thought is, if I may say so, it is just such a pleasure to hear you talk about positive things like what you described, as opposed to everybody trying to go to the airports to protest the Muslim ban, entry ban yeah. or, or playing defense for four years and wondering what the next tragedy is going to be. I mean, there's plenty going on in the world, but it's just so nice to, to hear, you know, positive actions like that. One other positive thing, and I shot you guys some stuff on um, policy issues in science in DC, uh, just FYI, but I'm now back on a national chemistry committee on policy, science policy and communication. And so we had a policy briefing on what's hot right now in Washington and what our professional society is doing to try to drive wedges in lots of different directions to enable positive change in policy. And the people on the committee are pretty high powered people. Um, people from director level positions at NSF, NIH, um, leaders in industry, you know, just really high quality people with broad perspectives. And so I think I'm gonna really enjoy that community. Mm. Which professional association? The American Chemical Society. It's, the, it's an international chemical society, about 160,000 members worldwide, um, owner of about 50 or 60 journals that they published, started early as well as chemical information systems. So they're a, an affluent, well-funded foundation from their own revenue streams of publications. And uh, they're a good body of people and they have a lot of outreach. They have a separate diversity area of activity um, you just go to acs.org and you can kind of take a look at what they're doing. But they have a complicated and rich infrastructure of committees and the committees are populated from people all over the world. One of my personal friends is on this policy committee and he's at a policy level in science in the UK. I've been very involved with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which of course has all yep. sorts of resources on science and tech and works with ACS and everybody else. Yeah, AAAS is also doing a lot of good stuff. I just haven't been as involved with them. Cool. Um, thank you. So let's go, Kevin, Ingrid, Mike. Hi. Um, I, thanks. I'm, that's really interesting, Judy. Uh, I've been working on this friends and family funding for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle for about six or seven years, and we've got this new fund. And uh, we figured out that really what it has is that it works for a really long time. And so we've uh, both uh, embedding it in a church context as a perpetual mission fund. And then we've got a college, uh, one college, and we're talking to two or three others who wants a club around it. And they would engage their students with local black and brown uh, businesses that are growing and they could do things like help with marketing plans, but that the money that it keeps coming in for a long time. So in the church context, where at least we're there, we're setting it up a half the money will be for a future resilience bond is what we're calling it and uh, people 26 and under which is where church groups mark off youth uh, will be a majority of those uh, who decide what to do with the returns that come in from the revenue share and that half the membership of that will be in the communities you invest in to decide on the money but it's it's kind of just and and the, to, to be put there uh the, the change you want to have has to has to take a, more than five years and so it's just having this future orientation with kids leading is kind of the design principle that people are getting pretty jazzed about and i think we're going to do some kind of thing alongside that like uh to augment that money with a uh you know a, um, a girl scout cookies uh thing where the kids would you know, sell something from one of the entrepreneurs and half, half the, the, they would split the profit with the entrepreneur and half would go to the future resilience fund. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool little design thing that people are getting really jazzed about. And it, you know, it does a lot of power shifting. Um, Kevin, did this, did this grow out of your neighborhood development kit? 
the neighborhood economic yeah development. oh yeah this is all from that and and it's just a you know that yes and and it is and one other odd thing um i've got some friends who are still trumpers and they're really excited they, they've got they've got proof they say that italy is the one that that uh, stole the election <laughs> that explains so much yeah. You know, I mean, that explains the pizza sauce on the server. You know, yeah, it, you know, Italy is such a, a source for coherent, uh, you know, uh, well well placed power that they were yeah. the ones behind the election steal. So, and they did it through satellites. Uh, so, anyway, was it uh, but, the new Starlink satellites or just old? old no, it's an old. Satellite. There's a satellite that they're, you know, the Italians are actually connected to, and that's how they reached all 50 states. So, Perfect. Anyway. But anyway. Perfect. But but the new design is get, you know is is pretty interesting because it's it's power shifting in lots of ways. Let the kids be in charge, and then let the people you invest in uh, decide. You know, be ha half of those deciding what to do with the money that comes in. So it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Um, love that. So let's go, Ingrid, Mike, Julian. So um, I, I I can't help but say that it what a week it's been of just change from two weeks ago when I was on this call. And um, it, I feel like there's something interesting in the air in that a lot of people now, I think are focusing uh, on, for what I'm feeling is the chaos of the whole vaccine thing. And, um, and not on the giant issue that was Trump and all of his cohort, right? So I feel like there's a lot of, um, not to sound too woo woo, but some strange energy in the air, especially because I'm over in the Netherlands and um, we were having something that came unexpected to me, having riots after they put the curfew in and sort of changing the whole feel over here of, I thought I was in a, a different kind of country and making me feel a little unbalanced this week. So um, I'm kind of wrestling with those kinds of things and, and don't have anything uh, other than that to share this week. Thank you. That's, I, I really like you drawing our attention to what's in the air because I, I have the same feeling. That's what I was trying to describe as, as, as I introed this call is like something's going on. There's a lot of people in resonant movements. Um, and what we can do now, I think, is find one another and sort of go to town on, on making things better and hook up Kevin's project to, uh, to everybody else's project. So cool. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, Mike Julian Gill. Yeah, it uh, definitely does feel a lot different in Washington. That people are not climbing the walls or waking up in the morning and checking to see what Trump has tweeted. But there is a lot of anxiety still and a lot of walls that are still deployed around Washington in case protesters show up again. Um, and just more and more crazy stories about these Republican QAnon supporters who are in the US Congress. The stories about the woman, the recently elected woman from Georgia. Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah, and just the Washington Post just did an expose looking through the last five years of her Facebook posts and just really threatening language and conspiracy theory thinking. Um, on a personal level, um, at Carnegie, we do an annual strategy process, trying to figure out what are the big problems to work on. And I have to say, I'm in charge of technology and international affairs, and there's just too many issues right now. And that's matched by the fact that there's just too much confusion and misinformation around all these policy issues. It used to be science and tech policy was a pretty narrow, close-knit group and people had been in it for a while and they really understood the issues. Now we have all these people popping out of, popping up from nowhere with no real experience, just repeating rhetoric and trying to influence the debate. Uh, and it's most obvious in the internet area, but you can see a lot of fear and uncertainty in biotech and art, uh, other areas in artificial intelligence. We're working on a big project right now on developing a framework of key questions that people thinking about doing a machine learning big data project should ask themselves. So it's a way to foster more responsible use of, of artificial intelligence. 
but it's just one of many targets we could work on. And again, this is an area where there's just so much confusion. People talking about accountable, uh, about ethical AI and transparent AI as, as if the technology can be designed so that only good people can use it. So there's a lot of, of, of things we're fighting against. Um, and, I'm, and I'm feeling quite overwhelmed just by the amount of information that's being produced. Just this week, there have been like three major reports on on the U.S.-China tech decoupling or the tech cold war, uh, and 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 the experts that are getting airtime just don't seem to be doing their homework, or they're not communicating. Uh, this week is the World Economic Forum. It's gone virtual. It's not in Davos. The panels on digital stuff just really hodgepodge and confused. I mean, good people, but no real discussion. So I'm, I'm, sound, I'm sounding a little, you know, maybe down and which is funny because I'm optimistic about where we're going, but I, I don't know how well we'll get there if there's so many different threads and so much confusion. And I think Do you feel like what's happened now, oh sorry, um, is okay. that because of um, all of the Trump era policies and every all the misinformation that it seeped into everything. I mean, literally, you're talking about science. These are hard facts, and nothing's hard facts anymore. So now we have all have to spend all this energy wading through all that crap to just get to where we should be, which is discussing what's real. Yeah, well, I think you're exactly right. The undermining of the whole idea of truth. And the fact now that policymakers, particularly on the Republican side, are so much more influenced by a catchy slogan than by sound analysis. And so things are moving very fast and, and ideology and press releases have a lot of power right now. Which is, sorry, go ahead, Mike, finish up. Um, no, I, th I think that that's the key point. Yeah, which is where I was kind of going is that OGM is about shared memory as a way of making better decisions. And uh, and I think that, that we, we need to do that like now. This, this, what we're doing is actually pretty urgent. And one of the little examples that floated by my, my radar this week was there, there was a question about uh, Republicans are saying, oh, uh, the, the January 6th was just a, a demonstration that got out of, out of hand. That's all it was, right? And, and I was thinking, well, actually, no, there were some like, well-equipped, well-trained, well-armed people who were like on a mission and had they actually gotten a hold of Pelosi or AOC or whatever, we don't really have any idea what would have happened, but there would have very likely been, been lots of danger. And then I remembered, I, I was trying to tell this story and I remembered, and it took me a little while sort of to hunt it down, but there was this guy, Anthony Curcio. Does anybody know about the Craigslist robber? Um, so uh, years ago when Craigslist was young, he decided to build himself an escape route. He uh, robbed a Brinks truck by spraying some pepper spray in, in, uh, in a Brinks driver's face and stealing bags and getting out of there. But before doing that, he had posted a job opening on Craigslist that said, show up at this square in a blue shirt with your toolkit and goggles, uh, and it'll be like 20, 28 bucks an hour, you'll get work. And so there were dozens and dozens of men walking around in blue shirts. And guess what he wore to do the, the, the Brinks heist, um, right? So he basically disappeared into the crowd. And it was a it was super clever crowdsourced escape route. And I, to use that as a way of explaining that if you're a proud boy or a three percenter or whoever who would like to get into the Capitol and do some mayhem and stop things, you're not going to make it through anybody in your camo and your goodies with whatever, but you could very easily get through in a crowd. So all of this is like great cover. And that means from my perspective only, there's a whole bunch of innocent people in the crowd going, woohoo, man, we just kind of washed up toward the Capitol and then look what happened. And, and, and I'm, also, I'm also a little bit drawn toward Darren Brown, the, uh, uh, the uh, not impressionist, what's it called? The, the, the people who basically influence us, uh, illusionist. Hyp hypnotistic and hypnotist yeah and Darren Brown has a thing where uh, he's in a he's in an indoor mall and they give him the microphone and he just starts sort of patter he starts talking 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 and then suddenly he says something and everybody in the mall holds their hand up and they don't know why they did it but everybody in the mall just sort of held their hand up at the same time and he was busy with his patter sort of priming that priming that behavior and then and then kind of triggered it and it's, it's a little bit like that's 
kind of happening on a larger scale in different weird ways. And, and then the, the whole GameStop thing that just happened is not that, but it's a similar kind of crowd phenomenon that, that we need to pay careful attention to because there's people trying to, we're trying to figure out what world we're in, mm. right? I think, I think we're busy trying to say, how does the world work? What's happened? What have we broken through the looking glass? What, what, how, does, how do we do politics? How do we do banking? How do we do uh, development? How do we help people who are hurt? All these things are up on the table. Like, the, like they're up for discussion right now. Um, and there's people with really strong feelings who are the old guard who have traditional strong feelings who were maybe Mike, what you were describing at the Davos panel is like, okay, good. It's good that you have an idea about digital privacy, but boy, that's like 10 years out of date. <clears throat> and mm. how do we, how do we update, how do we update everyone and get ourselves on, on sort of on the same page here? Now, sorry, and it's all orchestrated by the Italian government. Just want to move And how do we get a hold of those <laughs> Italians? Exactly. Um, Jerry, just to tag on to what you're saying about the, the insurrection, I watched some uh, some analysis of the, the footage and there were these military intelligence folks going, there was very clearly a group inside that large crowd that was on a mission. They were photographed, they were going through uh, senators' desks and congressmen's desks and photographing documents and um, they were telling guards, there's a million of us out there, which is a psychological tactic to say, you know, you're overwhelmed, you shouldn't even attempt resistance. It was very clearly um, a lot of military and um, uh, security folks embedded in that crowd who were there to do some real damage. Yeah, even even more than so. those examples, Ken, uh, if, you listen, if you listen to the audio, there are clearly people who had military command experience and were, uh, and, there were, and were coordinating and directing action. There were plenty of veterans in there, including among the defensive forces and everywhere else. So yeah, yeah lots of people with experience. Um, let's go Julian Gill Cedar. Uh, so Jerry, as a side note to what you were just talking about, I wanted to bring up a Will Smith movie called Focus, came out a few years ago. And it's, it's an enjoyable watch and co concentrates on uh, what you were talking about, creating illusions and getting people to do things. Thank you. So um, I've been making some progress on importing the ACM SIGGRAPH digital library into a graph database, uh, finally making some progress on it. And the other thing I'm busy with is uh, trying to track down someone's relatives when there's no immediate source of information, but he at least has an unusual spelling of his last name. Are you involved in any communities that are doing genealogy or other sorts of things or? No, no, I'm just, just trying to find, we know Bob had a sister and a brother, but apparently they moved to France and so, and I don't speak French, so. So it's just trying to slew things down. So. I think Capuchin might speak French. <laughs> I just had to I can help anytime. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I just had to hire a German genealogist to help find possible heirs. My uncle had a 35 year old will that mentioned his wife's siblings. She's passed she passed away 20 years ago. And we think the siblings passed away as well, but in order to get the will settled, we have to show a death certificate or something. It's mm -hmm. quite a process, particularly for a small estate. Um, also, I, po I posted in a couple of places online recently that um, I didn't know until I was 24 years old that my mother's father's mother was Jewish and they lived in Berlin. And there's a whole family history there that I don't know very much about because nobody ever told me the difficult stories of their childhood. Um, so I got invited into on Facebook, the Jewish genealogy forum, uh, which is an invite only forum that I stepped into and then like just held my breath and haven't done anything yet because the, the, the torrent of people like, what about this? How about like, it's, it's amazingly fertile, uh, invest, you know, shared investigation, uh, into people's histories. So I'm looking forward to, to finding the time to, to diving into there, but there's, there's all sorts of people doing all sorts of work here. The challenge in Germany is that all the privacy laws mean you can't learn anything about somebody who was born less than 110 years ago. Mm, that does suck. Um, so let's go back to our, our, uh, our cue here, uh, Gil Cedar Klaus. Well, thanks, yeah. Jerry. That's a, that was a good one. I didn't know about that. Cool. Um, thanks. Uh, really appreciating the richness of everybody's check-in. Um, boy, 
Um, on a good day, I'm in a, in a mood of fascination and wonder at living in the middle of, of history, the big historical wheels turning. Um, and it's not just COVID and the democracy crisis in the United States and elsewhere, but also the whole shift of post, post-World War II geopolitics, which is just, you know, basically turned upside down and people are trying to figure out how to even think about it, much less deal with it. Uh, and um, I've been kind of surprising myself watching some um, geopolitical analysts who look at the world through that lens rather than like a lot of us here through a lens of kind of meaning and purpose. And so we all want to go somewhere. And so I'm always looking at events through where I want to go and where I want the world to go. And I've been listening to people who don't do that. They're just saying, here's what we're seeing happening. And here's how we see those patterns in historical patterns. And it's very been very illuminating. So on a good day, I'm fascinated. Uh, on a bad day, I'm terrified. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm almost turning into a Manichaean of seeing this, you know, ultimate battles of good and evil playing out in front of me. Um, so that's sort of the background of where I am. Uh, in terms of activities, um, I'm thinking a lot and doing a lot in the realm of climate finance. Um, at a very practical level, working on a project in the Bay Area, trying to figure out how in the world do we finance the changes that have to happen both to mitigate and adapt on climate. Um, I'm not encouraged. Um, <clears throat> just completed a, a, a project uh, sort of loosely associated with the UN, um, looking at um, how global capital is applying itself to climate change and social good and surveyed about a third of the, glo- of the managers of global assets, um, highlighting positive movements and starting to build a framework to, you know, to, um, to shine a light on where the gaps are. Uh, it's a much more moderate and uh, bureaucratic report than I would have done if it were just up to me, uh, less edgy, but I think potentially very significant. Um, um, so there's that, and um, my own my own creative and entrepreneurial projects are starting to get back into gear. The last year or two has been a lot of hiatus due to personal, family, medical issues that we've had to handle, but those are clearing. And so, um, you know, the basic report on me is I'm back in the saddle and um, just sort of getting the horse to trot. Can gallop is is a ways down the road, but maybe maybe we'll get to trotting pretty soon. Is canter like a Jewish way of riding? Just kidding. Bad pun. Um, Your family's rubbing off on you. Exactly. And uh, just pulling a small thread from what you're talking about, and, and I'll, I'll describe this as layers of funding, but one of my amateur beliefs is that too much money attracts the wrong kinds of people to the wrong kinds of ventures, mm-hmm. and that many social problems that bedevil us aren't money problems. They're actually structure problems, framing problems, incentive problems, whatever. Um, and, and yet there's some things like getting a vaccine out to everybody in the country that require top down and some, and, and money and so forth. And I'm trying to figure out, is, does anybody know of, or has anybody worked on like, like layered funding approaches where what happens at the lo- lowest levels isn't the whole, it, it's not necessarily microfinance, but, but isn't too much money because mm-hmm. too much money tends to corrupt, right? And uh, power tends to corrupt, and money tends to go with power, and all those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But is, is, has anybody created a model of this? This doesn't ring a bell for anyone. Well, well the, oh, I... the question rings a lot of bells. Whether anybody's created a you know a, a model or structured systems to do that, don't know. Yeah, yeah. Matt, were you going to? Uh, well, yeah, yeah Jerry, I, I was just going to um, maybe probe here just a little bit because we've talked about this a couple of different you know, a couple of different times. And um, even in, even in, you know, early on with, with OGM saying, boy, if we could, you know, if we could get ourselves, you know, a couple of million bucks, we could, we could start building all these platforms and pay a bunch of people and all that stuff. And you've been resisting sort of that. Um, And I'm, you know, I wonder if you could go a click deeper into, into where your belief is coming you know, where your belief set is coming from and what is, you know, what is this dilemma? What is the tension that's created? Because I, I think conceptually, I agree that money corrupts. I believe that it also, you know, has a way of disincenting certain things, but it's also the only resource right now that we have to, um, to, to really get large numbers of people working on something for an extended period of time. You need to be able to you need to be able to pay those people, right? People still need, 
livelihood in some way. So unless everyone's doing things off the side of their desk, um, I, you know, and I think the side of the desk, you know, if you're a VC and a guy comes in and says, I got this great idea and you love the idea and stuff. And you say, how much time are you going to spend managing this? And they say, well, 20% of my time, because I've got this other job, you'll, you'd never invest in that person. So you do need dedicated capacity. And I don't know how to get there without, without some sort of financial stability. So um, I don't know if, what your, what your thoughts are there, or, or you can illuminate a little bit more. I'm happy to, and I'll do it. I'll try to do it quickly so we can get back to the check-in, but you're opening up great, big, juicy questions. So first you said like uh, money is the only resource we have to get many people working on something together. Uh, just look at Wikipedia and, and we can create collective important artifacts without money being necessarily the problem. And then you said also that money tends to taint or change a lot of, a lot of things. And that's totally true too. And then you said that, and not in this order, um, that it would be great if people who want to de de dedicate a lot of time to some project could actually make a living doing that, which I agree with a million percent. Um, and so how do these things, I think part of it is how do these things blend together? How do we make it so that we can make a living while feeding the commons and improving the commons and you know, building our systems of social interdependence and figuring out how governance works and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of these things, um, and, and, then, and then I'll turn to education where uh, everybody's like, education is the primary thing. It's one of the SDGs. Let's just pour a lot of money into education. And here I have ambivalent feelings like teachers aren't being paid enough, daycare isn't being paid enough, et cetera. But on the other hand, the moment you pour enough money into education to build gigantic bureaucratic in infrastructures of education, you're undermining what education kind of is, does, and maybe ought to be. And I'm trying to figure out how do you invert education so that it's learning? How do we scaffold user, you know, learner-led learning Mm -hmm. um, which shouldn't cost that much money. And then how do we flip it so that lots of people can make a living while coaching, tutoring, uh, exploring, leading expeditions, uh, doing a whole bunch of things around learning and, and drop the educational bureaucracy and all the other kinds of pieces of it. So, so I think money is needed, but, but big money in education from my perspective is going to mess things up more than fix things. So, how, so that's why I'm asking, this almost rhetorical question, like what are some really great funding models that, that, that will trip? And, and I think here, you know, getting people rewarded for a new role mm -hmm. um, and building that out as a market so that lots and lots and lots, we didn't know that there were gonna be shared people um, using their own cars to drive around the world, to drive people around their cities. Mm -hmm. like, like the sharing economy and ride sharing is a new business model as of a decade ago. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Cause there's a whole lot of people supplementing their income right this minute trying to make it through a difficult economy by doing that thing. How do we just do something more permanent, more interesting, and that, and that has actual money flowing through it that isn't the large blocky bureaucratic money? Gary, two, two, two thoughts. One is an example of how stupid we are about money. In the, in the early days of the business and environmental movement, um, investors were ranking companies based on how much money they were spending on environmental improvement. Completely irrelevant, because you could be spending a tenth as much and getting four times the results and you get dinged in that system, just right. completely as backwards. And you second, get what you measure. Second thought, universal basic income. Yeah, which yeah, is its own, say, own you have to have The baseline met, right? Before people can do the other stuff. Well, there, right. there are two philosophies on this. Some people think that if the baseline is met, people will just like, you know, lie around and watch TV and smoke dope all day. But they've proven that's not the case. And that's the other case is that with basic <laughs> needs met, people will actually do things that are creative and fulfilling and innovative and take risks they couldn't take if their survival depended on it. And also they're finding that just um, directed, directed payments to people who are, who are um, unhoused um, have remarkable benefits that cost less in the long run than the interventions required when these people get in trouble of all different kinds. Uh, there's a whole bunch of sort of evidence here and yet it hasn't influenced the policy regime enough that we're making the major kinds of changes, partly because there's a series of stories playing at the politics level um, that we're not willing to let go of. And these are the, the, the stories of neoliberalism and libertarianism and mm -hmm. you know, normal capitalism and free marketeerianism and all those kinds of things that, that kind of are seizing people up because, uh, and then there's all the, the you know, don't, you know, don't tax me so much, taxing is taking, et cetera. And, and these are extremely strong memes. 
<clears throat> and the other side hasn't done a very good job of figuring out how, how this all works. And, and I apologize, I've gotten us off into a, a pretty deep tangent, but I, I really like, this is an important tangent uh, to me because mm -hmm. I think that what we're trying to do together here could influence those conversations. And I very happily spend time doing, doing <clears throat> that. Um, so let's go Cedar, Klaus, Matt. Yeah, hi, I'm Cedar. I'm a recent graduate looking for work in the broad domain of uh, trying to make a positive difference. Um, this is my first time engaging with OGM in any capacity whatsoever. Uh, I discovered Welcome. it through the Consilience Project, which I don't know if that's something that's familiar to this group or not, but another sense-making uh, sense project. Um, so I'm here just to see what's going on in this group, try and make some connections, see if I have anything to contribute. That's awesome, Cedar. Thank you. Welcome and your cat too. Um, Thank you. Really nice to have you here. And uh, I'm familiar with Consilience, but not the Consilience Project. So the book and, and the work uh, uh, I've got, uh, oops, I think I did the wrong thing here. There we go. Yeah, I can um, pop a couple links in the chat. It's uh, something that Daniel Schmachtenberger is working on, if that name is familiar. Yep. <clears throat> that sounds great. Um, thank you. And so Klaus, Matt. Yeah, I think I'm going to turn off my video because I'm on mobile network. <clears throat> yeah, this has been an interesting week. And like everyone else, uh, there is indeed a lot of change underway. Uh, for once, I'm, I'm posting here how the Green New Deal network has uh, uh, coalesced now and really has become a force because uh, it's unified and there is a unifying message. Um, just to give you an idea here how, uh, how this all works, uh, we're now operating at state level, uh, putting in uh, legislation at state level that impacts uh, uh, farming, soil health. Um, and to, to, to give you an idea of what's at stake here, last year, farm income was 40% uh, government subsidies. So 40% of farm income in 2020 came from government uh, support payments that were made uh, to compensate farmers, mostly commodity cores, uh, to deal with uh, the uh, disruptions in the, in the global trade caused by the Trump administration. Um, so we're, we're now uh, directly linking with the uh, with legislators who, who are uh, writing bills and uh, putting forward bills and have the capacity to actually pass them. And the impact this will have on the agricultural sector is, is really amazing. Um, just another number to give perspective here. Um, when you take all the farmers markets in the country and the consumer supported agriculture CSAs combined, constitutes less than 1% of total sales, uh, at total food sales. So we have to, to get into the uh, retail markets and into the uh, general food supply chain in order to open, to open that up, uh, which means community activity. So we're, we're starting to work hyper-local um, and engage uh, uh, at community level to uh, because that's the only place where it can really work effectively but we're creating a macro structure where um where we have uh, for example uh, co uh, uh, written policy proposals that can be adapted uh, at the local level so it's basically a uh, um a modular system of support that communities can pull from and apply at their own local level. You can imagine the tension this is causing, and I. this is just the agriculture sector, food sector we're talking about. You have the same uh, energy getting into the, uh, you know, in the fossil fuel industries and in other places. So what the Biden administration does is what we refer to as shock and awe, right, coming out with so many things in so many places all at the same time, it is overwhelming uh, the capacity to, to have uh, a directed pushback 
uh, and, and an effective pushback. So this is pretty good, but at the same time, um, at the same time, this is creating uh, huge angst and anxiety uh, in in very powerful groups. So this is uh, this is going to be an interesting future. Uh, Klaus, thank you. That's super interesting, and it makes me think a lot about how we <clears throat> how we can sort of bring information, move information around about the highest functioning. Uh, or entities that are causing positive change in any of these spheres. And for you, uh, food agriculture, the whole food system, but how do we share with one another who the, like who, who's cracking the code on how to reorganize the way the, the, that particular ecosystem or value web or value chain works? Uh, and then share, you know, share what we learn from each into the other kind of thing. Uh, Doug, do you want to jump in? Go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask uh, Klaus a question. Klaus, in the agricultural projects that you're familiar with, is there any attempt to integrate housing habitat uh, into those projects so that people can live close to where the agriculture is actually happening? That's actually one of my pet projects, uh, intentional communities. Um, I haven't gotten very far with it. Um, the the um, There isn't enough energy coalescing around it, but I think it is uh, it is going to be an absolute necessity to have to focus on this because there, there are millions of people who will not be able to go back to the jobs they left behind or you know, they're gone permanently, uh, and, and many of those are you know, white collar jobs. They're not they're not uh, uh, entry level positions like bank and banking, insurance, and so on has started to replace a lot of work with artificial intelligence and, and, and forms of automation. So, so it, 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 it will be, it will be a, a dead center for people to pool their resources, you know, and, and, uh, um, and, and assist each other. Uh, you, you go to Scandinavia, Sweden, other countries, it's already commonplace. Uh, it's, they're, they're building, in, in fact, they're building housing structures around the idea of communal living. Um, so the answer is, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I think uh, uh, if, if, there's a, if I can see an opening, how to get into it, I would love to, but I haven't been able to. Um, thanks, Klaus. Right, go ahead. And I wanted to ask Klaus, when you talk about 40% subsidies, does it do any differentiation between these so-called giant corporations and then likewise individual family farms? The bulk of the money went to the top 10% richest farmers. It never reaches, it never reaches the family oh, farmer I'm, or the small scale farmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, most people don't know that. No? Julian, did you want to jump in? You ever that up? was my question. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, good. Let's go, uh, Matt Bentley Cappuccini. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm also really excited to see a bunch of new people, new faces, and um, welcome uh, to the uh, Thursday conversation um, and uh, or the Thursday check-in. Uh, I have um, a couple of dots just. Uh, connecting for me, I read an article in the Atlantic. Um, uh, I put it in the I put it in the Mattermost chat. Um, it's about the historian who could see the future, and he was a he was a, a biologist, I think, um, studying beetles and ecologies, and noticed in that field that you used to take these bugs and you sort of put pins in them, and and all you could do was sort of categorize them and measure their you know legs and their size and all that kind of stuff. And so he started to run some mathematic algorithms on their population so that he could predict whether or not their population would grow or shrink based on, you know, sort of these complicated system dynamics. And he learned everything that he could learn about that. And so he left and he decided to take on the only science that he knew that didn't use really mathematics in its calculations, that it was all observational and, and that was history. And he's built a model that basically, basically can, that he believes will predict when societies will collapse in on themselves. And um, 
well, there's probably lots of different variables. The article sort of states that it it um, that the like a major factor is when the production of elite um, um, uh, kind of the, the elite um, outpaces the number of elite jobs, um, and so what happens then is you get people that become counter elites. Um, and he would say that this is where the, you know, the Bannons of the world would be and, and even, even kind of even Trump in the world is that, you know, take the number of senators we have in the United States, it's still, you know, the, the same number that it's always been. Um, and yet the number of people who are qualified to be senators now is exponentially greater than it was when um, the Senate was originally created. And that's just sort of this that creates this dissonance. And then what happens is, is people, people who say, wait a second, I went to Harvard and I got my Harvard law degree and I spent all this money and I came from a good family and I'm networked and connection can't find elite jobs, right? Because knowledge, you know, because of whatever it is, the AI and, and those sorts of things that they, they, that, that dissonance caused them to start to kind of create these counter revolutions and counter elite movements. Um, I just find it interesting that first the mathematics of it, um, and can we can we understand? Um, I think Gil, you were talking about you know history, um, but can we understand history a little bit different than just you know through the sense making of the anecdotal? Um, I'm also I'm wondering, Klaus and Doug, if in your conversation, where does where does the um, kind of the kibbutz come into the conversation. I mean, these are, you know, community farms of, you know, shared living, um, you know, is, is that something to, you know, to look at? Um, and, and then I also think about proximity to land um, and proximity to food and, you know, just like restructuring all of our concrete um, uh, and, um, and then also the fact that we have to preserve more and more of our land, right? Um, and I think Biden, um, I was happy to see, is talking about, you know, kind of radically increasing the amount of um, land in the United States that's going to be untouchable, hopefully permanently. Um, and a lot of governments are going here. So I, 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 it's an interesting kind of tension as you think about, you know, the garden world, Doug. What what does that look like? And actually, can we? Can we claw back every single parking, empty parking lot? Can we claw back, you know, roads? Can we claw back, you know, things in, you know, there are places in Detroit that are just wastelands of buildings. In fact, I was at one last night, which was a, which a high school here in Boston that's actually been shut down for three years and it's completely boarded up. And it's this massive structure, you know, that should be torn down and turned back into green space. Like how quickly can we, demolish, you know, you know, those things and turn them back into green space. So those are the things that have been on my mind, you know, lots of different fragments, but I, I appreciate you listening and, and the time. Thank you. And, and these dynamics are absolutely fascinating. I think we're, I think we're all interested in, in, in them. So um, let me go to Bentley before he has to drop off the call. Someone want to jump in? I put a website in uh, intent from intentional community map. Um, that's a group that that uh, connects people who have an interest in in uh, shared uh, living uh, arrangements, um, and they have uh, multiple examples between like rural or inner city and so on. Um, so so I, anything anybody wants to do, there's already somebody out there who has laid a structure and a foundation for it. Sounds great. Uh, let's go to Bentley before he has to drop off, then Capuchin, <laughs> then Ken. I was actually just corrected by my wife. I have 30 more minutes, so I apologize for jumping oh, the line. That's okay. <laughs> but I'll take the time anyways. Uh, so talking about uh, misinformation and making group decisions, um, I'm uh, starting to go public with a project I've been working on for a while. It's called Goalie Bot, and uh, I'd appreciate it if anyone would want to... Um, participate or, uh, um, uh, you know, give advice or just any, any sort of help. Um, uh, I, 
I posted it in the forum and I'll post a link in Mattermost. Um, but basically it's, it's kind of to fight misinformation and it goes into a lot of what some people were saying in the chat about facts, understanding what facts are, um, how that leads to decisions. Um, and one, the gullibot is just a character that, um, uh, that kind of models this proper thinking, but it also has, it also documents all the conversation and puts some math on it to kind of show you how Gullibot is coming to uh, its conclusions. Um, so that, and then, and organizes the information in a way that's really easy for people to explore what they need to read rather than reading everything. Uh, so it saves people a lot of time in understanding it. Um, um, so that's uh, that's the project I'm working on, and, and um, uh, so if anyone finds that interesting, reach out to me. Cool, and it's in the Mattermost. If you want to, uh, if you want to replicate that yeah. link in and the Zoom, yeah, in the Zoom chat, just, that'd be great. Oh, good. Pete just threw it in there for me. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, love that. And so let's go, Capuchine, uh, John Cumbers, and Ken. Um. Hi, um, I think for me, there are quite a few things cooking. Ready to talk about having- Your audio is cutting in and out, yes. I think I'm having a problem with my headphones. If, if it breaks again, let me know, I'll stop. So far um, Okay, one of the things get, that got me most excited uh, recently is this book, which maybe a lot of you are familiar with, David Epstein's range, and uh, which is basically a little manifesto for uh, not specializing and uh, looking elsewhere for patterns and all about you know knowledge transfer, which I feel goes hand in hand with having a diverse community uh, looking for solutions in other fields and so on. So this is a little bit ogm -y. And other than that, uh, the I think biggest project on my mind right now that relates a little bit to some of the things you've discussed is uh, the transfer of our festival unfinished into a permanent platform. And I've always dreamed of making a time bank as because uh, we have this model of pay with your time to get into the festival, but we're really or I'm really searching for ways to find this as a kind of long-term solution and looking at alternative economies. And I mean, I, I don't have a solution, but Jerry, your question earlier was uh, very on point. And maybe I, I know that there have been some documents shared previously in emails related to this subject and relationship economies, but uh, if anybody has at any point something very practical in previous experience related to using time as a currency. Um, I would love to hear more, but I can also dig in through emails because I know there's a bit in there. So there's a, a fellow who's in our communities. I don't know that he's on the OGM list. I think he is, but he hasn't been on our calls here much. His name is Michael Linton. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was one of the people who helped create lo a local exchange trading systems or LETs. Um, he would know a lot about this. He's trying to work on circular currencies now, um, which are hard to understand. At least they're hard for me to, to absorb. But, but <clears throat> and then separately, the, the Holochain people uh, come out of a project called MetaCurrency, uh, which goes back 25 years worth of hard thinking and hard research. And Arthur Brock and uh, a, a, few other, a few of his collaborators have thought about these issues very, very deeply. Uh, and, okay. apparently, and apparently Pete's very interested as well. Yes, great. I will. Michael, Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking, Capuchin. Um, Michael is, is, uh, is always on, almost always on the Metacogs calls on Tuesday, I think it is. I, let me know if you're interested. Cool. And do you want to explain Metacogs? Uh, and, whoever, and Judy, could you mute your, Judy, do you mind muting your? Metacogs is a sister organization uh, run by Robert Best, as, as far as I can tell. Um, it's, it's a good crew, very quiet and contemplative, um, but, but also lots of uh, intelligent thinking and discussing. Cool. Thanks, Capuchin. Uh, let's go to John Cumbers, and then Ken, and then John Kelly. John, you have frozen on us.
No. <clears throat> um, Kent, do you want to step in until we get John back? Sure. <clears throat> so um, I just learned something about Zoom this week that I, after all these years of being on, I didn't know. If you're in gallery view, you can actually move people around. So you just click on them and you can move them. So I've been actually lining people up after they've gone. So I know who's still left in the things. Just kind of helpful to, you know, simple, fun, little, fun little thing to do. Um, I have a question kind of directed at Mike, um, but maybe somebody else knows this answer. In 20... 18, I saw um, General Martin Dempsey, retired uh, general from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And um, he, told, he told the audience, he said, the thing that keeps me up at night is cyber. He said, the US is falling behind in cyber. And the new administration, he was still at that point fairly respectful of, of Trump, said they're doing nothing about it. And then of course we had the huge Russia hack. And I haven't seen anything coming out of the Biden administration about what are they doing to strike to harden our, our cyber security. So um, I just, before I go on, I just wanna know, Mike, do you know anything about that? Has he made any announcements that you're aware of? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happened there and including some really good people. Rob Joyce uh, is gonna be the head of cybersecurity at NSA. Um, no, it's it's moving ahead, and I, I could it put is. something. And I have to leave here in one minute, but I will put something out right now. You know, there's a lot of excitement, both the quality of the people and the fact that this is on the agenda. Great. There was also a meeting. The State of the Net meeting was yesterday here in Washington. It's an annual conference, and there was a whole thing on uh, the Biden plans in in digital policy. And of course, this was uh, this was one of the areas. Now, I, I I'm very confident we're making good progress there. Thank you. I'll, I'll sleep even even better tonight than I've been sleeping for the last week, which has been way better than it's been for the last couple of years. So, appreciate knowing that. Um, on a more personal note, I'm experiencing vicariously um, a. Uh, fallout from a diversity, equity, inclusion um, initiative at my wife's college. Um, there's a person there. It's a very small college. They teach nutrition and, you know, it's, um, there's not, it's not like a big sprawling campus, but there's a woman there who's Asian and she is just waking up to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she's very triggered all the time. And she's expecting other people to not trigger her rather than to um, develop a little bit more, um, uh, forgiveness for people's unconsciousness. And she's forcing this issue on other people and it's having a really bad effect. Um, so I'm just noticing that, and I've seen this before um, where, you know, people get a little woke and they start to, you know, you need to be better about this instead of how can I help other people to wake up themselves? Uh, it's a very directed thing. And it's had a really harsh effect on my wife's um, job level of satisfaction. You know, suddenly she's like, we're supposed to be teaching nutrition and we're devoting twice as much time, it's all online, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the students are not getting what they need to do their jobs uh, and, and to get through the course because it's a pretty technical science-based course. There's organic chemistry and stuff. And, and so I'm just noticing that um, it's one of the ways in which a very well-intentioned um, uh, thing can be really misused. And, um, you know, it, it, the woman is not in a place where she's actually ready to talk about it. She's, she's just too triggered by it, which means really my third point. Um, for those of you who know the organization called Braver Angels, um, I'm going to put a link here in the chat. Uh, they're having a, uh, they have a bunch of, of events all the time, but one that I've signed up for tonight is a national um, online debate about what are facts so you can get online and if you want to engage or just observe, you can watch people who are self-identified as red or blue, which I really don't like those labels, but that's what we have, uh, talking about what constitutes facts, which seems to be something that's been threaded through this particular conversation. So the, the link's there um, and you can, you can uh, log in. They have these all the time. So if you can't make it today, you can, you can go another time. I think it's at five o'clock uh, West Coast time tonight. And just really nice to see everybody here and some new faces and also the, I don't wanna say old faces, but the familiar faces. Thanks, Ken. And your timing is really good because I, day before yesterday, I got a note from an old friend I haven't heard from in a long time, who's writing a book about what are facts. Mm. Uh, so I'm gonna send him that one. Uh, love that. Uh, and I think we lost 
John C. I think I don't see him in the grid. He may have had to bounce at the top of the hour, but I don't think so. Anyway, um, John Kelly, would you like to check in? Yes, thank you. Uh, quick personal, I, I've been devoting a, more time than I wish I had to, to uh, non-COVID or COVID ripple health related emergencies that affect people in my circle. They can't get care because of COVID is in front of them. And so then I have to, you know, deal with things in terms of negotiating how to how to get them taken care of or get substitute things going on. And so that's that's taken a lot of time. Uh, it's a, it's important work. It, on some level, it's gratifying, but, it, you know, you wish it wasn't happening both for their suffering and it takes me away from OGM kind of stuff. I'll, I'll share one kind of wild, kind of crazy OGME idea. Um, I am very interested in the subject of misinformation, disinformation. I used to teach a critical thinking course developed by a global business network called Asking Better Questions. I've looked at the material that's developed for teachers. It's good material, you know, on how to look, how to analyze media, how to look at things. There are several sites that do this kind of fact check, fact analysis, and also do bubble, bubble mapping, you know, this is the right, this is the middle, this is the left, you know, and, I, and I've looked at those and a threshold for all of them is you have to care considerably more about the issue of misinformation to make it through those sites than the people who to, to whom those sites are directed. So that's the basic problem. The, the people who are misinformed don't see misinformation as a problem. <laughs> and uh, so here's the leap, here's the, here's the the incorrect leap, and then you can move backwards from the incorrect leap uh, to a better solution. The incorrect leap is, well, remember when we had equal time on the networks? Remember when, oh, if we're going to show this side, we have to show the other side. We have to give them the same time. This is this went away in the 80s. Uh, Reagan administration took it out. Um, but also, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to um, internet reality, digital reality. But if you take just that concept, and you say, all right, I just accessed this site. If you want to tell me all the factual problems with that site, I'm not that interested. Uh, in fact, if you want to show me an alternative site, I'm not sure I'm interested. But if you just went down the site and you said, okay, here's something. On this point, here's an alternative view. Here's this other site. So it's not equal time. It's, um, it's contrary follow. You know, you look at A, well, then you're going to look at C next. Sorry, you know. Now you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, that's a complete violation of people's freedom to search. Okay, so what I'm talking about is a voluntary uh, browser that might be adopted by schools. It might, so it's an educational device. We say, okay, let's look up something that has a point of view. All right. Now notice, notice that while we were looking at it, the AI was saying, where is a, where is a twist? Where's an assumption that's in this page that is, can be reversed with data on another page? Go get that other page. Now put the two next to each other. Now the teacher, or if, even if it's in, you know, independent learning, you now have the capacity to discuss, oh, wait a minute, here's two points of view and there's data between them. Wow. Hmm. What does that mean? And people might sit still for that especially, you know, if, if it's a voluntary thing or if it's done with students, you, you volunteer for this, you go through that process, you'd sit still for that longer than you would sit still for fact checking, which is important, but it just, it, it loses the critical audience that I think we need to engage. So if anybody else is interested, I, I, I noticed what uh, Bentley said, uh, I'm into, you know, I'll follow up on that. And also, yeah. you know, any related things, you know, let me know. Okay. Thanks, John. There's a few things that have crossed my path of people trying to figure out how to do argumentation, how to compare facts, how to, how to open people into that conversation. Because I think you're right that fact checking is like a thing you ignore. It's, it's sort of a, a, a thing that's very easy to just dismiss. Um, so we need to enter that loop some, in some other way. Um, let's go Doug Scott Eric.
Okay, I, I noticed that the word information comes up in many contributions this morning. And to me, it's a very problematical concept. It implies that we know what we're talking about uh, and we know how to measure it. Uh, it's striking, for example, that a random string of characters, the length of Hamlet, has more information in information theory than Hamlet itself, because Hamlet's fill, filled with redundancies, which reduce the amount of information, which is, of course, counterintuitive to what people like us would want to make information mean. So it's core concepts like that that I think are up for rethinking. One of the ones that's been on my mind this week is comes from a book that I've been reading called uh, The Form of Politics. And the analysis is that politics begins with friendship, uh, that Aristotle and Plato were clear that coming together out of the family into the town was based on friendship and, the, and anything that looks like an initiative is the organization of friends who have shared interests. Uh, that tells us a lot, I think, about the Trump supporters, uh, that their relationships are much more based on uh, faith, fidelity, relationship. Uh, I'm with you because we share the same kind of thinking. Um, it's really powerful if you start thinking of friendship as the core of politics, because our society organizes against friendship in so many ways. Isolated families, uh, we've replaced uh, uh, the, the center of the town with craftsmen, with a mall where you go in anonymously, you buy and you go back home to indulge with your private toys that you, that you purchased. Uh, so I think that's uh, really helpful. Another piece that's been on my mind, and this is almost too complicated to talk about, but I'll try. A friend of mine, uh, Bob Artajani, is retired uh, chair of the history department at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. And he's been writing a book, which is in draft, on complexity theory and its impact on public policy. And basically what he's saying is, that our history is in two phases. Phase one was mechanistic science leading up to Newton and on with people who thought atomistically and in billiard ball models. In that world, the humanities was pushed aside because it found the mechanical view uh, ugly and unrepresentative of the issues it was dealing with. What happened within science was a process that opened up the Newtonian world through first thermodynamics and then quantum mechanics. And that opening is now beginning to affect the way the hum humanities can think about themselves as being uh, rational models that are not uh, causal in the simple sense that A causes B. Uh, I find it a very powerful framework uh, because it's saying basically we can think about the humanistic future in more disciplined terms uh, without having to become uh, mechanistic in our thinking. So anyway, those are, I guess the context for all this is my work at the Institute for New Economic Thinking and trying to get economists to think out of their formalistic patterns, which uh, just support the rich getting richer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I wish we had David Weinberger on the call here. He's a very good information philosopher uh, as well. Gil, did you want to um, jump in? Yeah, just, just, just real briefly. I wanted to wrestle with Doug when he started, but I really love where you got to uh, as you rambled through, Doug. Um, I'm of the mind that uh, information and reason are highly overrated uh, in our world. Not that they're not important. Uh, but they've become central for some of the reasons that Doug was talking about uh, and, and missing the power and the value of emotion and body wisdom uh, and very much relationship, Doug, as you were talking about. Uh, and we're talking about information density. I found myself thinking about poetry, um, which, you know, can be full of redundancy. Just think back to, to, to Ms. Gorman at the inauguration last week. And, you know, you said that Hamlet, which is full of repetition, has less information, but, and, you know, in a Shannon-esque way, maybe so, but in a human way, it may have many, many more layers and dimensions of information. 
So we need to break that story open. Thank you, Doug. And there's a whole bunch of angles here on sort of emotion and presencing and uh, sort of our interpenetration of each other that matter a lot. Mm -hmm. And one of the nice things about our Thursday calls is that we, we sort of get a lot of that here, that, that we're, we're, we're trapped in little Zoom rectangles, but we're sort of not because we're in this other kind of space and we're some of the things that we talk about are very heartfelt and we bring ourselves in that way. <clears throat> so I think that, that um, we need to keep, keep diving down that that uh, particular shoot because there's a lot there's a lot there. It's a it's a great topic. Um, Doug, can I just you know I'm interested in can I put something again in in the chat? But um, you know human beings make decisions primarily on kind of three factors. One is the rational factor, and this is what we're talking about with information and facts. And you know it's about facts and figures and stuff. And we like to believe that we're more rational than we are. It's a very small part of our decision making process. You know the second piece is 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 based on our emotions, right? Our fears and our wishes. Um, ultimately, those you know those motivations. And then the third sphere is is this political political sphere. And politics, actually, I like I like this idea that it 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 start it starts with friendship. And what is you know ultimately what friendship is is a, it's a connection between two human beings or a group of human beings and human beings I think we sometimes again in our um, reckless abandonment of of viewing ourselves as being a part of nature don't really see ourselves as what we are but you know we're 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 herding animals right we like to be in large you know groups of people. Um, and you know the idea of safety in numbers, and um, uh, some. I, I wish I could kind of point to the research, but I once heard that our brains light up with the same level of fear um, when we're being ostracized or shunned from a group as uh, if there was a lion in the room, right? That is the, in some ways, the most painful thing that you can do to another human being is to sever their. Um, their ties from other human beings, their ties from that friendship, right? It's, it's the reason why, you know, a baby would die without human contact, even if it was fed and, and you know, had all of the kind of the support structures, because we're so dependent on intimacy with other people. Um, and, and so political decision making is, is all about maintaining your status and your power within that group, so that you reduce the amount of risk of being um, ostracized, of kicked out, of being shunned. And I think that's why it's such a powerful motivator. Um, and to say that the origin is about friendship, right? I think the origin of friendship is, is, is in our idea that we, we can't really survive on our own. We need others to survive. So just, just a thought to you know, kind of poke a little bit with what you're saying. Well, let me respond back a little. Uh, I'm going to object to the idea that rational and emotions are two separate domains. Mm. Emotions are very rational because they're in the service of life. And that leads to quite a reframing of the way we think about those. Yeah, and just to add on that, how you feel in your inherent sense is a fact. <laughs> so I want to think rationally about our emotions and our state. So yeah, I don't see them as a dichotomy. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'll give you, I'll give you just a practical example of, of where the separation comes into play, right? You go down, you go down to your, you know, the car dealership and you buy, you want to buy a car. Um, and um, they say, we have everything you need. It fits your family. It has the safety that you need. It can break. It's got the heated seats, whatever the features and functionalities are of that car that you want and you desire for your family, but it's in, it's in a color that you don't like. Um, um, and so you choose not to get the car or you choose to spend an extra, you know, couple hundred dollars to get the car of the color of your, of your desire. That, that's a different type of calculus than going down and saying, well, I could choose this car, a minivan, which has all the things that I want, or that car, a suburban, you know, big Escalade, which has all the things I want, but I'm going to not choose the minivan because I live in a neighborhood where um, 
people will look down on me if I have a minivan because everybody drives the Escalade. That's, that's really about maintaining a status, you know, your status and power. So yeah, they're all, they all have a type of rationality to them. Um, I don't disagree, but they play out in the way in which we make decisions very differently. And sometimes we go against things that make sense, right? In the kind of the purest form because they feel good to us. And that, and that, that's something that I think we have, that's the reason why I wanna make those distinctions is because it, it starts to explain why it doesn't matter how much facts you put in front of someone, it, if it doesn't feel like it fits their identity or fits their relationships or fits their idea of, of the group that they're in, that they're trying to maintain status or power, then they'll disregard those facts and those, you know, those kind of um, those features. Um, Gil, and then back to our queue. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate that, Matt, but I want to be careful with your assertion that emotions are facts. Um, because I didn't, like, I didn't assert that emotions are facts. Uh, that, that was Bentley. That was me and maybe Doug. Oh, Bentley, then you, I'll beat, I'll beat up on you, Bentley. No, I, I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but I want to challenge it from this perspective. Um, uh, physiologically, uh, my body signals for when I'm afraid and when I'm excited are the same. Mm. The, fa the physiological facts are identical. The interpretation that my emotions give to it are different. Uh, and those are on one level true, but they're also something that I can that I can cultivate. When I began my martial arts training, I would be afraid when somebody would strike me. As I developed different responses in my body, there'd be no fear. There'd be opportunities for movement that weren't there before. Same physiological facts. So this is something that was, you know, I, I, I was I was hearing in the earlier part of our conversation. When we talk about information and facts, we need to really carefully distinguish between, well, you know, common everyday example, honey, it's hot in here. Well, no, you know, you feel hot, but I feel cold. Well, the thermostat says that the temperature in the room is 69 degrees. The fact is 69 degrees. So right. the artifact of the machine. The it's hot in here is, is in a different realm. It's a request. Fact, feels deeply true. An indirect the person request. who's saying it it's no it's 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 an indirect request yes it's also you know, somebody's interpretation of how they are feeling in that moment completely valid for them but not in the same domain of truthiness just a step in the middle between you and bentley um so isn't it a fact that the woman who stepped into ken's wife's forums online got triggered and is like pissing all over the conversation and really warping things in, in some way. It, it, doesn't that sort of remain a fact in the community now because she did that and it was her emotion and, and that triggered it. And I completely agree with what you said about how we, how we deal with incoming stimuli is up to us. It's a choice we make, I'm totally sold on that. But the fact of a thing happening, of an emotion being triggered, like lies in the mm -hmm. ground and affects other people. And isn't that a fact? I'm gonna draw a distinction, Terry. The fact that that person spoke in the meeting is a fact. Right. Probably. Go to the video to me. The fact that she triggered a, an emotion? No, absolutely not. Because the emotions, the emotional reactions of different people in the room are likely going to be different. But that's fine. Aren't those their local facts? That's their that's their local experience. Yeah, yeah. But which is, is, we're which, is like, what do you mean which is an important thing to take into account when you're being rational. Yeah. Yeah. People's emotions, and, and when you're being right. a human, and so the fact that someone has that emotion is one of the facts to consider. It, we're actually arguing over the definition of the word fact, and the truth we is, are. the word fact encompasses all of what we're saying. Yeah. We're just using the word in different ways, but all of them are. That, that's where factual. the danger. Is. That's <laughs> where the danger is, Bentley, because we use the word in different ways, but we treat them as equivalent, and we mm -hmm. lose something very valuable in blurring yeah. those distinctions. Yeah, I have another project to help with that, by the way. <laughs> Very cool. I mean, it's, it's a fundamental problem. You know, you've, you've probably seen the witness studies where, you know, where, where they, um, they show people a movie of a blue car driving down the street and ask them to describe what happened. And some people swear it was a red car and some will swear it was green and some will swear it was blue. What's going on there? So we, yeah. we should carry this over into the philosophy zones of our, of our discourse forum online, I think. Because uh, these are these are big deep issues. Let's go if we can. We have only a few minutes left in the call. But Scott, Eric, Vincent, Pete. Hi everyone. Um, I'll take it back 
down to a simpler level. Um, I've made really good progress on my Thinking Skills for Kids program. And I'm going to paste something into the chat, but I'll kind of read it out loud. <clears throat> so I tried to explain this to my 30-year-old son, who's an AI researcher. And he said it was a bit much. It was hard for him to, to grasp the whole, sort of like the, the room behind you, Jerry. Um, because my approach had been to show him, here, look. And he said, it's too much. So I found a, a in, the, in the two days that followed, I found a better way to say it. So this is about making friends with the thinking skills you already use. You're gonna learn how to think deeply about anything, how to save thoughts for use later, how to make anything that doesn't exist yet, how to play games with everyone else, and how to aim the story of your life. So each one of these categories contains simple stackable lifelong skills. I wanna see the kids see themselves as agents as in they have agency and understand they're in charge of their lives and how amazing that is. They can then fight, we'll see if this comes about, the evil wizard shrug and break the subtle and insidious spell that's being cast over the land of helpless. I'm picturing it as a pilot enrichment program for independent schools and homeschooling parents to begin with. Very nice. So that's what I've been uh, that's what I've been working on uh, pretty hard. I've been pulling back and going deep on that, hmm. and my goal is to make it just dead simple. Mm -hmm. It has to be, or it doesn't work for me. It's kind of where does where does where does the conversation we were sort of just having fit in the model, which is how do I process my emotions and my, my somatic, sensory, it's, visceral responses yeah. to all this? It's all in the story framework. So my story framework is attention, um, valence, balance, sequence, lessons, and you. And each one of those helps you grasp the sense of where you are in this continuous flow known as your story. And so, so it's, it's really a, uh, it, again, without trying to get, get too far off into it, that's um, my testing in the last several weeks has been in every interaction that I have. When they're having a conversation, when someone says something, can I point to my framework and say, that's where it goes? Right. And I'm and, wondering, and I, I'm, I guess I'm wondering if Scott, if what, what Jerry's um, adding to is another how-to, which is, you know how to feel, right? Um, well, what I'm, what I'm trying, I'm not. My goal in the thinking skills, and, it, and this is deeply embedded in my own personality, is I do not tell anyone how to feel. I won't do that, and that's, that's the part that I, I'm, I'm teaching you how to think, how to engage with your environment how to think about a problem, how to build something, but I'm not telling you what to build, what to think, what to feel. I'm, giving well, I'm not saying so what you feel, feel, but there are, the, the, maybe the place where Jerry's at is there are techniques. And I think, um, you know, Gil was suggesting some of these things which are about processing your feelings at a, at a much- yeah, journaling. So, so one of mine in the lessons right. category, I have reflect, why, and sense. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so those get to the sense of what happened, why was I a part of it, was it random, was it malevolent, what, you know, that kind of stuff, and, and figuring out your place in the stream of events. But um, yeah, so the thing that I'm going to try to do is get it out in a sense that, in a, a way that people can look at and then ask the first question, which is, does this make sense? The next question that I'm trying to avoid at the moment is, what else does this need? Because with groups like this and the groups that I've been interacting with, that's just a, that's a bottomless pit. And I, I wanna make sure that what I put together makes sense as, as its own. Um, the, the last thing that I'll leave you with is this is a, something I wrote down um, a week ago, I think. It's just a thought I've been thinking about. 
So it relates to trees. And the thought is that young buds and leaves can't understand their place or purpose without understanding their trunk and branches. Mm-hmm. And it was just this, I, and I don't know if it's true, that's what I'm thinking about it, but it's this idea that, that the new growth needs to understand its connection to what came before it and what ultimately might be feeding it or how it's feeding back into what came before it. Mm-hmm. So I, that's a theme that Jerry, you've stated before, how do you bring what's good of the old and what's good of the new. Mm-hmm. And so that's my thought. Totally. Thank you, Scott. Um, j- just uh, two things. One is I love your framework. I think you're, you're achieving a crispness of expression that, that is, 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 is lovely. Um, and Matt was channeling my question really well. And it, all of this reminded me of a conversation we had many calls back, which was, hey, this is called open global mind, but what about open global heart? And, and like mind means thinking, means rational, means maybe we can all figure this out just by logicking our way through. And hey, half of our discussion here has been about, you know what, we get hijacked all the time by stuff that isn't about thinking, it's about how we respond. It's about all, you know, how, how this all happened and how we suddenly were not able to think or we're thinking about something entirely different because our, you know, our, our reason got hijacked. Uh, and also that there are players who are intentionally hijacking uh, our emotions. That limbic hijacking is, is like apparently a, a sport now for smart political operatives and, and, and other interventionists. So I think that there's a whole juicy mix of, uh, of things that we can dive into over time here. But uh, um, I think what, what Matt and I are trying to ask is, how does that nexus of stuff, which is just like what happens to our lives in the world, how does that fit into your framework? Is, is uh, the way we're, the, what we're trying to ask. Um, so we have not a, go ahead, Scott, do you want to reply? No, it, it's, that's the challenge of trying to give you 100 individual words that are nested in a framework that looks something like this in a, a brief overview. So I, I get yeah. it. I appreciate all that feedback. And, you know, I, I can't do anything with it without doing a deep dive that we don't have time for. Awesome. So we'll, we'll have to make room for the, the deeper dive. Thank you. Um, Eric, Vincent, Pete. Yeah. Um, one thing I was thinking about during the call is like, what's the overarching theme was my question in the chat. And it's like, often in the media, they stated as a problem is like, people don't take in facts. They don't take in science. But then I think, no, that's not actually not really the right place of the problem. It's more, for me, it seems like knowledge management. That's the problem. We don't have societal knowledge management that's properly done. And that's why I asked the question, like, what's the most overarching word to say that? And I think philosophy doesn't cut it, but yeah, that's that's one topic that for me is interesting. What do we call that problem? And up until now, I've, I've been calling it like societal knowledge management. And then the second uh, thing I was thinking about, yeah, I would like really to have like a group of people supporting each other on making things move forward. Like I would really like a kind of co-coaching group or something for OGMers, co- collective intelligence people. And um, I'd like to set that up. And I ho- I wonder if there's other people who have the same, like it's it, like a really practical group where you really work on your topics, on your work. It could also be something like facilitation or anything what you want to make happen in the world. Um, can you riff on that for just a moment longer? Because I'm, I'm, I have thought three different, three different versions of what you might be saying showed up in my head right now. I'm like, which, mm-hmm. which one do you mean? Ah, huh? What do you mean? Uh, so can you can you just explain a little bit more what you're envisioning? Uh, so co-coaching is basically it's a real method where it's like two people that talk to each other and they coach each other, and it's both professional coaches that coach each other. Um, but my, my idea is like you have a group of people and you have like a check-in, like I wanna work on this, I wanna work on this. And yet, then you pair up or you are in smaller groups and you work for a while and it's kind of pragmatic, but it could also be emotional stuff that you're stuck on. Kind of with the question of uh, 
what what is getting you stuck in the moment and what will help you move forward in where you're at oh i could um, definitely not use that that sounds very, <laughs> yeah okay well no I'm, I hope... I'm kidding i'm totally kidding yeah <laughs> no, i understood but uh yeah okay let me sing so um it it strikes an emotional chord in me i don't can't help it um so um just a moment huh? <sighs> I'd, I'd like to organize it and find someone who can help me. So if anyone wants to step up, I'm not a, I'm not a good single organizer. I'm a good organizer with others. So if anybody else uh, feels like that, please. Um, Pete, know. does this sound like we should create, we could create a co-coaching channel in the Mattermost? Yeah, certainly. And just uh, Eric, Eric, you're on the Mattermost, right? Yeah, and I, I'd like to make it uh, calls also, like recurring calls weekly or something like that. Yeah. Um, let's figure something out on the on the Mattermost and, and, and see who, see who's interested in playing there. That'd be Thanks. great. And then with apologies for your lateness in the queue, Vincent and Pete. Hi everyone. So um, I don't know how much it was mentioned at the beginning, but I've just been completely flabbergasted by the entire uh, GameStop stocks <laughs> shorting right now, mm -hmm. and. It, kind of send me into a frenzy of trying to understand what's going on and what are the implications for like larger scale coordinated action. Um, to summarize for anyone who hasn't been uh, kind of watching the news, um, a Reddit group called Wall Street Bets that went from like 2 million to 4 million members in the last 24 hours, basically um, coordinated to all buy GameStop. Um, and so, and it, it was a bunch of retail traders and they bought it because it was short, it was going to be shorted by a bunch of Wall Street hedge funds. And so um, the hedge funds are losing millions, if not more of dollars because they basically shorted the stocks and had calls in. And so when they ramped the price up, they were forced to buy them when they were high. And the fact that people are figuring out that the stock market is kind of just a big game and are now trying to like play it in the same way that the Wall Street um, people do is incredible to me. And I think it's kind of showing the ridiculousness of it. And also there's a lot of um, pushback right now where, you know, all of the like traditional financial institutions are going on and saying, oh, they're like breaking the law. This is illegal, but it's like the same exact thing that um, that the big financial firms do, except now it's being done in a peer to peer way mm -hmm. via Reddit and they're really mad about it. So um, I uh, yeah, I, I want to <laughs> fuel the shenanigans potentially because I think this is incredible, but I'm wondering what other people think about this and the implications for coordinated action and now that we have like reddit and the internet what that means and and tiktok as well it's like crazy recovery um thanks vincent and uh yeah see, Pete has, just, has a, a lot of useful links for 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 that story go ahead matt yeah just to add a data point there i i um we do a lot of work in the financial services sector and um this thing blew up right away um across that across that whole you know, that whole sphere. Um, so it's, uh, it's being taken notice. I think one of the things that's, it's getting interesting is um, corporations are waking up to the power of sort of the negative power of the social media, right? They used to, they kind of pushed it off, at least, you know, some of my clients, oh, that's, that's politics, and that's Trump, and that's all this kind of stuff that's going on outside of us, but it's coming to a theater near you. And I think um, the more that that happens, then the more people are going to wake up and go, you know, time out. We've got to we've got to think about things differently. Now, you know, it's interesting about whether or not you think each individual action is positive or negative. Um, but it's it's clear that you know systemic change is um, is happening because of where we are with our technology, and people are taking notice. Again, we're sort, of, we're sort of trying to figure our way through this. Mike. Just real quick, uh, I've been fascinated with this as well, but I'm concerned about the long-term implications because it could mean that the social media platforms and Reddit is pressured to kind of try to rein in some of this, this behavior. And, and there is 
a national security concern that some of this is being fed by bots and trolls from overseas yes. who have already undermined our democracy and our faith in elections and now would like nothing better than to get a few thousand people doing things that undermine our faith in markets. Mm -hmm. well, and the system usually elaborates some kind of defense mechanisms, like there are circuit breakers in the stock market if trades exceed certain thresholds, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe that happens without, without sort of closing things down entirely, maybe that happens, but we, we need to learn how this works because if anybody can say, hey, let's go get even with, with you know, so-and-so down the block, and then it turns into their economic wipeout, that's a big deal. Yeah, but it's kind of already happening. It's just, as Vincent was saying, only a few players have, have the ability to do that um, because of but, their size and scale. So right. maybe we wake up to, to those, those nefarious actors as well. So the first good- Heading overseas now, we're seeing at their markets and other stocks affected. Ah, interesting. Um, so the first good uh, history book I ever read, because I, I love history, and, but the first good one I ever read, and I'm not saying this is the best history book, but uh, is a book titled Tragedy and Hope, uh, written by Carol Quigley back in 1966. Uh, here's a link to it. And uh, basically it's a history of the financial uh, world from about 1900. He gets to 1900 pretty quickly by talking about major sort of layers. And then from 1900 to, to 1966, uh, going through the Great Depression and a bunch of other things. And it was super interesting because it was like pulling the curtain back and saying, well, this is kind of uh, what those powers were doing. And until recently, the curtain was pretty opaque. And, 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 and all of a sudden, the curtain's being drawn back. I don't think it's fully drawn back by any means. But at least the power shifted, or the shoe is on the other foot, to borrow a, a corny metaphor. Um, and so we're in new territory now. Um, Pete, do you want to check in? Yeah, um, uh, it, it's funny. As it was, as we were getting close to nine thirty, I was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to keep it short and quick." And now it's like, "Well, we're past nine thirty, so now I don't have to keep it so short and quick." Um, uh, thanks, Vincent, for bringing up the um, uh, the Wall Street bets uh, hedge funds tangle. Um, it's interesting to me. I, so I, I I I recommend that some of the links on on the forum thread I started, which there's a link in the chat to. Um, uh, don't assume you know anything about it until you at least read uh, at Toxic's uh, thread on Twitter and some of his replies to questions about his thread. Um, uh, it's, it's very interesting. It's uh, For me, it, there's uh, some interesting uh, emergent and collective action things. Um, uh, and also innovator incumbent uh, dynamics, uh, which we've learned about, you know, we, which Christensen taught us about a long time ago. Um, it's, it's odd that the innovator in this case is, you know, a collective action um, and the incumbents are, you know, are the, the core of our, literally the core of our life. Um, you know, the, the finance system that we've kind of all grown to, um, be subject to. Um, uh, so I, it's a very fascinating thing. It's a watershed event, um, very important. Um, and and again, like literally you don't know what's going on until you start reading more about it. And then even then there's no way to find out. Um, the the uh, wolves hiding in a, in, in a collective crowd of sheep um, is just the same way that the capital situation was, is definitely a component of it. Um, so, you know, hedge funds, there were hedge funds that made lost billions of dollars and there were hedge funds that made, made billions of dollars. Um, uh, the, uh, another thing that's really top of mind to me, um, is a thing and a meta thing. Uh, top of mind for me is B117, the UK COVID variant, um, and the other related variants. Um, they are certainly uh, uh, more infectious. Um, it's funny to me that when I hear this on the news, it's always, they're, they're much more uh, infectious. They're highly infectious. You know, it's like, oh, it's, you know, it's 50%, uh, 50, 60% more infectious, which gets turned into in the news, like highly infectious. And it's like, well, 
But on the other hand, um, that highly infectious encapsulates uh, an understanding of, or it, it doesn't actually, but it points to an understanding of um, exponential growth. Um, humans, I just just watching, you know, the past year, um, and you know, before that, uh, it it was always a lesson about. Uh, it used to be in the olden days, in the before times. Um, exponential growth was uh, about interest rates, right? Um, you know, hey, you should save, you know, ten dollars a, a week for you know your whole whole life, and you know it'll grow like this. Um, nowadays, it's like, okay, we just changed the exponent from you know 0.9, the R naught, to point from 0.9 or one to 1.4 or 1.5. You know, and and what does that do to the exponent, uh, the exponential growth curve? And it's just something that that. It, it's it's fascinating to watch for me. I guess this is the meta thing. It's fascinating for me. It's fascinating to watch that people just don't get exponential growth. It's just not a thing. Um, you you don't understand you know how the how the math works. Uh, there was the prime minister of Denmark, I think it was, who had the the she has this cool metaphor of you know okay imagine the national stadium filling up with water. You know there's a faucet next to you, one drip. And then two drips, and then four drips, and then you know, and you know, the, the stadium fills up in I forget 44 hours or something like that. But it's not until the 42nd of those 44 that you really are panicked because the rest of the time it's just like, yeah, it's not very much water. I don't know what we're what we're freaked out about. So um, uh, I, I sp feel this especially because uh, uh, Governor Newsom was apparently or or felt pressured to, you know, start undoing um, the lockdowns that we have in place, while in other parts of the country, uh, Germany and France are going, okay, well, now we're going to switch from this, these cloth masks work really cool, um, but now we have to get serious and use medical grade masks instead and, and uh, yeah, out in public, you know, and it's, so this dichotomy of like, well, in the US, there's a lot of feeling of, well, we got through it, you know, the case rate is declining, we're, we're all good, and we're declaring victory. While other countries are going, okay, if we didn't if we didn't have the surveillance that we did, and we didn't do the sequencing we did, uh, we'd be, you know, we would think that we were fine, but we're going to freak out because we see this, the the train coming, and it's you know not not going to slow down, it's not going to stop, it's going to get really bad. Um, uh, we had some mention of. Um, uh, genealogy. I happen to be one of my one of my passions is uh, genealogy, um, and uh, I, I I feel like I have this big success story. I when I you know for most of my life I knew my grandparents. Um, uh, one of them, one of them actually was in an institution, and she died without me ever knowing that she and I lived at the same time. Um, my grandfather. Um, one of my grandfathers passed away when I was just a little kid, but I, I at least knew who they were kind of, except for the grandma that was in the institution. Um, but I really didn't have any connection beyond that, you know, and, and I kind of despaired of, of ever getting any. And then finally, way too late in life, by the time that my grandparents had died, I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Uh, what got me into it was probably uh, DNA actually. Um, but anyway, I started doing research and now I know like, all of my ancestors back like six gen uh, six generations or so, and I know some of them back ten. I've, I've got a few branches that go back ten. Um, I wanted to share real quick. Uh, this this kind of happened for me this morning, um, so it was top of mind. Um, this is a picture of a tiny bit of my uh, uh, family tree from a little village in uh, southeastern Poland called German. Um, the, the leaf nodes on the bottom are DNA cousins I've been in touch with um, and one aunt. Um, but what's fascinating to me is that as you go up, um, these people were from a small village. So there was lot of, lots of uh, siblings marrying siblings and things like that. And, and when I first started bumping it, so you see that the, these lines start crossing towards as you go up. and. Since, since I have a very few leaf nodes here, this is actually a picture going up of a very small um, set of, of a much larger, larger set of lots of cross lines and things like this. What happened this morning for me was I bumped into somebody's family tree who I hadn't known nothing about. And she started filling in some of the blank areas up, up at the top here for me, which was really cool. Um, 
So the uh, this is this particular thing I, I know a fair bit about. Um, uh, in the 1800s, uh, I, I've got pretty good access actually. Be, thank, thankfully, thanks to the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints, um, uh, who really kickstarted consumer gene, amateur genealogy. Um, they they made sure that a bunch of the documents from um, you know from the 1800s were preserved, genealogical types of documents like parish records. So uh, through the through the uh, lovely beneficence of uh, LDS, uh, I've gotten to see like tons of pages of... Um... <laughs> you know why, right? Oh, I, I totally know why. Um, yeah, they're going to hijack and they're going to baptize the, the people Mormon. Uh, many of my, most of my, I, ha I have many uh, ancestors who have been um, forcefully post you know, post-death uh, baptized by the LDS folks. This is the greatest uh, crowdsourcing like hack ever. It's it's like uh, so so the so the bad news or you know the news is they have a belief I, I won't characterize it as what kind of belief but they have a belief a very sincere belief apparently that um, you know everybody's related up and you should baptize all your ancestors and stuff like that the outcome of it is they they have been of the you know of the religious fanatics that the u.s houses for instance they are fairly benign um and the other thing is they help me know my ancestors because you know they've done a lot of work they do all their work they, they give all their information to me for free basically including things like microfilms of the chairman baptism records from you know mid 1800s which i should not be able to get to but they've got them in salt lake city and then i can go into my local with some trepidation and fear, I can go into my local uh, LDS church uh, and, you know, just for the cost of postage, no like overhead, no handling, no anything, no rental time on a microfilm machine. I'm looking at microfilm records from the 1850s from my ancestors. So- Damn, didn't know that. Wow. Um, it is an yeah. amazing and wonderful thing. Uh, yeah. family, FamilySearch.org is also run by them. They have an amazing amount of information anyway. The, the thing that fascinated me today was, is like, I f there's, there's this whole branch that all of, like my ancestors from the early 1900s were in, intermingled with all these people that came over from Poland into Chicago. And, then, and I could tell these people were like really close to each other and they were friends and things like that. But now, thanks to this new information, I'm actually a fourth cousin to the person whose family tree I bumped into, and I, I can see exactly how. And she's got a whole bunch of like filling in the gaps things. So one of the things that always puzzled me about this chairman thing was how they kept from marrying too close, cousins too close. And, you know, and so I, I, so because it's like, okay, I'm sure we're fourth cousins, but I think we're probably related through a couple more connections. So we're 4.5, you know, 4.5th cousins, 3.5th cousins. Um, and I was like, well, I'm sure they didn't have rules written down or things like that, they, but everybody just kind of kept track, you know, and it, there were, f there weren't that many last names. So you had to think in your head, you know, okay, so I know her grandmother and I, I kind of know her great grandmother and, you know, we're not related through any of these connections, so we must be good. So it finally struck me why there are wedding objections you know, why we ended up with wedding objections, you know, uh, you know, do you have any just cause why this man and woman should not be wed and holy matrimony, blah, blah, blah. I always, you know, growing up, I always naively kind of thought it's like, well, you know, he's going to cheat or uh, I don't like her or something like that. It's like, that's the last chance you've got to ask the extended family, everybody in the village, yo, are these people more related than they should be, you know? And I thought that was, you know, it's like, oh, that's why we have wedding objections. Scott, you have a, a, a thought. The, the most mind-blowing fact that I learned last year is that you are the latest in a set, an unbroken set of ancestors that all lived long enough to successfully reproduce. And depending on your belief system, if you believe in the science, that goes all the way back until the beginning of life. And that to me is absolutely like, I can't even get my head around that. That you are, you are, are the, it's you the only are reason the we're here. Of the success. 
It's yeah. just the only possible reason that you exist right. right now is that every single one of your ancestors successfully made another one. And I think I told this story a long ago on an OGM call, but I was using one of the ancestry sites long ago in the early intertubes days. And I started, you know, putting things up and I started learning what it took to verify one person, you know, in, in this tree. And then it dawns on me, oh, wait a minute. Once my verified person is a verified person in someone else's tree and our trees have suddenly clicked together, as Pete was just describing, I suddenly have this feeling like I've clicked into the giant tree of life. And I was already an enthusiastic user of the brain at the time. So I then had the parallel thought, oh, I'm busy weaving trees of knowledge and whatever, whatever. And once I can start clicking mine into yours, into everybody else's, we're suddenly weaving this giant mycelial network of, of knowledge of, of what's going on. And that was really exciting to me. It's one of the reasons why this conversation is happening now. I can sort of trace idea. I can trace meme, memeal DNA back to, back to that moment way back when. So Pete, thanks for taking us into this territory. Anything else you want to add to that? Um, I do. I w one one more thing on on I, by so if if people are interested in finding people in the U.S. especially or um, or DNA D DNA based uh, genealogy, I'm, I'd love to, to chat more because I think it's it's really important. I also have this weird guilt. Maybe it's not weird. Um, uh, every time, every time I make connections in family trees, and every time somebody gets their DNA sequence to to match up with ancestors, you're also feeding the surveillance bots that you know. Um, so, so me getting my my DNA sequence means that anybody who's like you know within third or fourth uh, cousins from me is also like extremely well known at this point to uh, anybody you know any law enforcement who cares to subpoena the the right information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so then o OGM stuff, um, uh, for some people, um, especially folks that I think mostly have left, <laughs> um, this call, uh, might be the, um, might be the main way that, that, uh, that, you know, you think OGM exists. It also exists in, in other places and other times. Um, some of us just use this OGM, think of OGM as this call. Um, others of us think of it as a larger, larger organism. Um, helping to make sense in the world and things like that. So um, there are places where we stay in touch. There are forums, uh, or there's a forum and uh, a chat system. Um, I'm going to put my email in here and uh, let me know if you want to be more connected to those. So now, now that I look at all the faces, I think we're all connected, except maybe Cedar. Um, uh, the there was some good work this week uh, on the steering call. We have a, a weekly Tuesday call that um, folks can attend. And we did some good work on trying to think about whether or not OGM manages itself and how it might manage itself better, if that's something that we want. Um, uh, I've also kind of in the background, I've got a lot of thinking about how federation, I, I, I've explained how federating within OGM, I, I keep explaining, I guess, and I get further along. Um, so in the course of explaining it a couple times this week, I feel like it started to crystallize and, um, uh, and I could, I could imagine for at least a short time before I got distracted by other stuff, uh, actually writing up a, you know, like a how-to document of how, uh, OGM works and how Federation works. Um, so, uh, that's, that's in, in the queue kind of. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Um, my brain is full, the wet one. Uh, and I'm grateful for your presence, all of you. And maybe we wrap the call now. Jerry, do you um, want to do any kind of check in? I mean, you've been sort of dropping things in along the way, but um, you know, you often are the one who does not check in. So I just want to see what's up with you. Um, yeah, briefly, I, I'm, I'm, my brain is like all over, all over the place as usual, but I'm, I'm heartened because Free Jerry's brain is about to put things in, in the broader OGM community that I think will be really useful and lead to some experiments. Uh, my conversations with Jordan at Lionsburg are turning into something that we're going to present to the OGM group as well that might turn into actual sort of organizational structure that let us do many more things and be part of a cohort of a federated set of entities that are kind of like us only in completely different spaces moving forward. And that's really exciting. Uh, and then all of that is in the background radiation context of this seems to be in the air 
and uh, I keep running into people who are who are doing stuff that matters that's seen that's really like resonant with what we're up to. So I'm, that's that's got me very very excited. Uh, yes, definitely, Matt. Um, so that's just like the briefest of check-ins. I think ne uh, next uh, Thursday I'll do more of a check-in myself. I'll put myself in the queue. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Nana, Nana. Let's be careful out there. <laughs>